Well, let's we can just let's sort of leisurely get get started here. I I know many 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 of you on screen and 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 many not. So welcome, anyone who's new. Welcome welcome. We're so nice to have you join us. <clears throat> if you're brand new, and just happened on to this, uh, with, at Zen Peacemakers we do programs like this every week. Sometimes sometimes two or three in a week, and we really try to to uh, to vary the topics and keep it interesting and bring in, you know, t terrific, terrific guests and presenters to uh, educate or inspire us uh, in our work, in our lives. And, um, and so we are uh, absolutely uh, blessed today and as we were two weeks ago and as we will be uh, for the next couple of months. Uh, to have our good friend Roshi, Eve, Mion, and Marco, um, who crafted this program uh, out of whole cloth, and uh, it's it's beautifully constructed. I'm 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 sure everyone has looked ahead to see what the uh, the, the next six sessions are about, and we've gotten such a beautiful response, um, and you are a testament to that. Uh, uh, and I think uh, I think both because, and I don't want to flatter here, but uh, Eve did a really good job of putting together the topics so that they are compelling. But also, I think we really struck a nerve with this topic, for you know, for obvious reasons as we look around the screen. <laughs> so thanks very much to to Eve for doing this work. We had a two weeks ago. We had a great first session. Be sure to look ahead, and as your time allows, join us for the next six. Uh, I think as a group, uh, it'll be really, really helpful. And if you miss anything, know also that we do record these, and it takes us a little a little while to cook the video and get it put up on the website. <clears throat> but ultimately, they will be on the uh, zenpeacemakers.org website under the media library pull down. So uh, should you want to, you know, Go take a look again. So, we didn't come to listen to me. I will keep my eye on the door here because people are still arriving. And I'm going to turn this over to Eve. And Eve, if I spotlight you and you don't like that, you can change your view back to group. But I'll spotlight you so that so the recording comes up that way. And you are now spotlighted. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, you're right. I don't like to be spotlighted. <laughs> and I like to look at people. And I like to see them looking back, if, if possible. So if you weren't here two weeks ago, I talked. I actually have no memory of what I said. What did I talk about, Jeff? I talked about getting old. I, I know I did that, but I have no memory I, 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 what was I, said? I, th I think we're together on that one that's why we recorded it's a it's a it's a digital memory <laughs> yeah so again i'm i'm eve marco i'm in the northeast of the united states in massachusetts and i started this not because i'm a great maven or expert on getting old but because I'm uncovering it like you may be uncovering it. And I already learned a long time from my husband, Bernie Glassman, that the best way to learn something is to give workshops on it. <laughs> That's what he used to do all the time. Boy, you want to learn something? Start teaching. And I'm, and I'm really intimidated speaking about people who get older in different ways when I see Jennifer Dorn. And one of our participants was waving. And I'm almost nervous about asking Jennifer to talk about herself and her work. And if you think that things lack significance as we get older or things lack value, you really got to check Jennifer Dorn's work. But maybe she'll say something later. And again, a lot of people here that I know, it's nice to see David Birnbaum here. <laughs> yeah, 
I have a memory of your being there when Egyoko and I did a whole series on householder koans, right? Yeah, and uh, and it's really nice to see Christina Jerzykowski, who was just a yeah a wonderful person, and especially our retreats at Auschwitz owe a great deal to her. With that, let's welcome to the series on aging. So yes, the whole thing of us, I'm getting old, and how is that affecting how I experience life, uh, how I perceive life, and how I perceive that others perceive me? That's a big deal. This week, the theme was, do I still matter? And, and I think it said there, I've always been so important mainly to me, right? <laughs> now I feel like Joe Biden. Do I still matter at this age? Okay, and the next session, which will be on December 4, a day before my 75th birthday, is Am I Still Loved? That's going to be the theme in December 4, and I'll say a little bit more about that at the very end. And I don't feel it would be, first of all, I want to thank Jeff O'Keefe a lot. He puts a lot of work into these presentations, and this time you're without Chloe, so you're, I know you do a lot to prepare. And as, and this is a wonderful gift from Zen Peacemakers. I have a lot to say about Zen Peacemakers. And I do want to encourage you one thing that doesn't, that I think increases rather than decreases with age is gratitude, gratefulness. And if you feel that at the end of this session, please make a donation to Zen Peacemakers. It takes quite a lot of work to put these things together. Okay. With that, I like to get questions a lot during the thing. So if something comes up for you and it's not in the space of sharing or asking questions, just put up your electronic hand. You can also use the chat. Jeff is really good at monitoring that and, you know, letting me know if I've overlooked something. I also hope you have a pen and pencil near a uh, pen and paper or use a computer or something where you can write and at a group this size the only way we could really share and let every pe person speak is when we break up into small groups we we you 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 all will get a survey i know jeff sends surveys out after every single program so we got from 2 weeks ago and he sent the results to me and the single biggest thing people said that they liked is when they were able to talk it was really important to them one after the other said that so we're now at 90 people i don't think we can, you know, but we can do it with small groups. And I say this because I know some people don't like to break into small groups. But it's in the spirit of generosity with each other and also for yourself so that you can hear thoughts being articulated that you may not have realized are there. When Jeff breaks people, please just say yes and join. I think it'll be a, a great gift you're giving others, and I hope also for yourself. And with that, let's start, Do I Matter? And I like starting with a song, and it goes very fast. So we're so Jeff's going to put on the song, but he's also going to show the lyrics. Otherwise, it's hard to, to follow it.
Just to set the proper tone. <laughs> Yeah, but let's take, let's just start thinking with how the culture looks at this, what culture we live in. I've been told that someone my age who writes and has written for many years will never get anything published because it just won't happen to people in my age. Maybe if I write some Zen books, maybe. Zen's kind of nice about it. It likes older people at least for now. Other than that, I have nothing to say as far as the world is concerned. I feel like I'm seen as a leech for collecting, med for collecting Medicare and Social Security. These are often referred to as entitlement programs, which always, it's a funny label for me, it always left a funny taste in my mouth, entitlement programs. I get literally every day, literally every day, I get at least one phone call that is a scam for Medicare, asking me to give over my Medicare number. I get ads like crazy, especially now for Medicare health programs, you know, the supplemental programs. I get lots of ads on drugs and supplements as if that's all I'm about. I also get very nice ads on our beautiful retirement communities that I don't think I can afford. You know, where you see this really good looking couple and they're looking out over the ocean from the balcony of their apartment or they're on a golf cart and they're looking very, very happy. I get those ads also. And, and they're very good looking, the couple. So our consumption potential is seen as diminished. So who cares, right? Who cares about people who don't consume as much as the culture would like us to? When politicians talk about getting our vote, they talk all the time about Social Security and Medicare. That's what they talk about. It's as if voters like us, at least in the United States, and I need to preface this always, in the United States, because there are people here who are not in the U.S., voters like us uh, are seen as people who just care about Medicare and Social Security, and as if vision and, you know, other political positions are just not important to us. You know, the issues that we care about are Social Security and Medicare. And I'd like to add this caveat. Social Security and Medicare in this country, there are people who struggle, I know, to get medical insurance. And I'm very aware of that. So I'm not making light of it. I'm not making light of that at all. But it does get kind of dull when that's what you keep on getting all the time. There's obviously nothing else interests you at this age. And that's not true for me at all. But I wanted to just reflect back to you what kind of culture we live in. And this is what we're contending with and what we're being challenged by day after day. So... But this is how I'd like to start. If you can get a paper pencil, and in one minute, just make, it just won't take long, just make a list of, about your work. What work do you do? If, you know, I mean, you're still working, even if it's just taking care of a home, taking care of grandchildren or of other people, or if you're working in regular jobs, or if you're outdoors, but, Mostly your work in whatever form it takes. Maybe you're on a board of some nonprofit or you volunteer at the homeless shelter. You know, whatever. Write your main work. Just take another 30, you know, 40 seconds for that.
Okay. Now, underneath that long or short list, please also write the following words. My life is not important, period. And after that, my work does not matter. Your life is not important. Your work does not matter. About everybody has it. About two years ago, I don't remember what prompted it, but I actually wrote that down for myself and I've had it next to my computer all this time. And in fact, here it is. It's on this piece of paper. Probably can't see it, but you know. Your life is not important. Your work does not matter. And I have it as a reminder to myself every single day, the whole day that I'm by my computer, which is much of the day. So this is what I'd like you so please take now, keeping your pencil, take about five, six minutes and write what comes up for you when you read these words. Your life is not important. Your work does not matter. And really take it in. So I'm, so I'm going to give you about five, six minutes to do that, okay?
Okay. I see that in the chat, Helen Hobart wrote, big difference if I write my life or your life. You're right about that, Helen. Thank you. You may not be on the screen that I'm looking at, but I appreciate what you said. On my note that's been accompanying me for two years, it's it's as if I'm talking to me. A reminder to me, your life is not important. Your work does not matter. That's how it's been. That's how. That's what's sitting here on my desk. Okay. And now what I'd like to do is to for, for Jeff to break you into groups of five people per group. I know not everybody likes to do that, but it's a very wonderful and generous thing to do. And really look into what comes up for you when you write that. What if... What comes up for you if you have this note in front of you every single morning? Is it positive? Is it negative? What happens when you're looking at these words, when they echo in your mind day after day? You know, your life is not important and your work doesn't matter anymore. How does that feel? How does that feel? And, yeah, so, and at five, yeah, we'll, we'll break up for about 20 minutes, no more than that. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that went smoothly. Uh, a little less smoothly this time. We were really, that's okay. We didn't have enough time in our group, but I speak. Joel Kreis, Kreisberg, I think you're there. Would you feel comf comfortable sharing even with this big group because you haven't had a chance to speak at all in our small group? Wow. In front of uh, me. Talk. Again, <laughs> the things about I ask people to make a few items of what they do. And then the words, you know, I'm not important, and my your uh, you're not important. Your 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 work does not matter, Joel. Well, okay, I guess I get the whole audience. I'm Ekai Joel Kreisberg. I live in Ghent, New York. These days, I run a sangha that came out of Hollow Bones Zen, which is uh, Junpo Roshi, who is a a, a Dharma heir of uh, Edo Shimano Roshi, and I'm retired. I've been a homeopath and done many things, and so I feel like, uh, in terms of, I think after working with illness for a long time, while I feel like I've had positive impact on people's lives, I've kind of got over the idea that we're going to get rid of disease, and we're, we have to be in service of the endless dharma of illness that's going to keep coming up and just being of service. So that works for me now in my role as a running a mostly an online sangha where we practice the dharma and we support those who want to come and and practice and you know pay attention and try and be of service in the world in a bodhisattva like way. Uh, that's the, the very short version of it in front of everyone. My life is not important. I think I resonate with that because on the one hand, I feel like while I've had, I feel like there's been impact. I recognize that everything is impermanent. So there's always another whack-a-mole of suffering that's going to come up. And it's nice to have been able to... Well, support people in their healing journey in various ways, but there's just an endless amount of it. So I just couldn't be of service and in service of, of folks in any way. And my life doesn't matter. I don't know what to do about that particular thought. I feel like, I feel like I've got a lot of feedback that people have been very supported by me. And I recognize that we're all one and there's an endless amount of, of suffering to go around. So we just have to 
keep showing up and being of service as best we can. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to open this up for some, for long, about six, seven minutes. And just to throw a wrench into things before I open it up, and please use your electronic hand, which you could use, I believe, by using, well, Jeff will tell us how to do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, de depending on what you're using, it's it's under React or Reactions. Okay. And uh, s since we've got three screens, we can't see everybody, so that helps if you want to Let speak. me just throw a wrench and just share what I did in my small group, which is that I actually found those words that I wrote really important for myself and really a relief and kind of a restoration of certain proportions for a woman who tends to be fairly self-centered. So I'm just going to say that, kind of, in other words, instead of just saying, oh, yeah, that's the culture, I say, no, 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 no. Something else comes up with those words that is, for me, was really important and positive, I think. So having said that, please, if anybody would like to share, we have some minutes to do that, please. Please raise your electronic hand. Kathleen Hoetsu, you have your your hand up from Germany. Thank you. Hello, yeah, thanks. I want to just shortly connect to relief, because that was something that I also shared the group that my first bodily sensation after I heard you uh, speak these sentences, Eve, was relief in the first place, as if a kind of burden was taken off my shoulders in a way that there's a lot of responsibility that I feel for how the world goes. And if I'm not that important, I might relax a bit. Yeah. All that in short. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that, Kathleen. It's good to see you. Mark uh, Atkinson, I see your hand. Yeah. So I think the people in our group express uh, a certain level of of comfort with this, with these concepts that being important isn't really that important and that it's that's something that you learn from getting older and and also i think we all felt that whatever we're doing at this point in our lives the work that we're doing matters because it matters to other people it matters in small ways unimportant ways in the big scheme of the universe right. small things it is made in the big thank you so much for that mark yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting distinction to me yeah 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 i see karen and john have their hand up yeah so i got the distinct impression that when I said what I said in the group, in the breakout room, that the people did not agree. I, I think that my life matters, doesn't, my life does not matter except to a few people, my wife and my children and maybe my grandchildren, but that's all, that's all. It matters to only a few people. And the work that I do is matters to, to my wife and I, <laughs> what I can get done for us to make our life convenient. And I and I said, after working for all those years, I worked over 50 years. And, you know, you have to get up every day and do whatever it is you do, and then you retire. And I and then when I retired, I said, I was never going to tie a lace or put on a belt or buttons anymore. I was going to do everything was going to be simple. And... So life is, life is not important except that when I choose to make it important and life is, and my work doesn't matter until when I choose to make it matter. Other than that, 
it has nothing to do with anybody else except me. Thank you for that, John. Thank you. Okay, Mira. I have to respectfully disagree with your premise. <laughs> My life is very important to me. I think we have all been put on this planet with millions and millions of years of evolution behind yeah. us yeah. and all this Systems that are in my head and in my heart and in my organs have been refined through so much of experience and adaptability and so on. And I'm very grateful for this life. And I do not believe that I want to look at myself through the lens of society's utilitarian perspective. I think I want to define myself in a different uh, way entirely. And I think I do a lot of, like the other gentleman said, I do a lot of small things to stay in my community and to participate in a positive way in the lives of others. So my life matters a lot to me. And, <laughs> and I think there is sanctity in, in all life. And I have great reverence for all forms of life. And I have to say that every day there's something new and I wake up every morning with a great amount of anticipation and joy. So, yeah, that's me. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah. Okay, Jennifer, hi there. <laughs> hi. Well, I, I have to say first, thank you, Eve. This is just a very special. We may not let you ever stop this series. <laughs> we may, we may ask that you keep doing it. I want to just start by saying I just had a wonderful, uh, sensitive laughter and silent uh, exchange with four of the people here. So it's just one I've known because I've sat with before on Zoom. But I want to thank them because it was really a um, remarkable time to get grounded in this. And my, I wrote not true, not true. <laughs> Absolutely not true I to agree. both. And I thought maybe I missed something. So I'm always open to going deeper. But because it's not my, I am important. It's my life is important, which in me translate how we live our life daily. And my work does matter. I, Eve, you'll remember you turned 75. I turned 80 in 10 days. I told the group I can barely say this to anyone because I have in my mind what I'm supposed to be if I'm 80. And I and when we started, I looked up the, the average life expectancy for a woman in my beloved South Africa is 61. Oh. I mean, I just is like, whoa. Not fair, which is what keeps me going. So I I work full time. I just returned from Chile and Brazil doing the work I love on global health equity. I feel, and every day I, you know, my kids stop asking me when I'm going to retire. And my best friends have finally just said to me, you you love the work you're doing. And I go, yes, but I'm going to be 80. You know, like that's supposed to be something. Do I feel old a million times? Absolutely. Um, I look in the mirror and I was like, that's not the face I'm used to seeing. What happened? And then I, I told the other group that I, you know, I, I have a, a real commitment when I'm on the subways of seeing other women in my age range and before they off the train saying to them, you look really beautiful today. And it kind of is, violates the subway rules of you're not supposed to talk to anyone. But it's just a remarkable way to see people. And, and kind of that's what I do in the world. I did publish a book last year, as you know, Eve. And, but it's a reflection of women that I helped birth. It's their thing. And all my work is really about having people be visible. And, and that's what keeps me going. I don't... 
like aging because we're not supposed to. And some way we keep saying it's this wonderful next chapter. I don't know. I struggle with that. I struggle with that a lot. But I do feel, um, well, one great person said in our last group when we were talking about kissing and sexuality, we didn't quite get into that, but we were in it in a certain way. You know, I feel absolutely strong life force and and I'm so grateful for that. I don't take that for granted for a day. I'm so grateful. And every day I get to be with the most amazing people working, living in very hard circumstances and trying to have a a respectful and principled life. So that's what keeps me going and makes me feel, I guess, young at heart, <laughs> even if the body moves differently. But And I'm really grateful. I mean, I, you know, not everyone gets to fly overnighters and and then go to work the next day. But I don't, I don't take that for granted at all. So anyway, not true, not true. It's my hands. And I'll have to sit if I'm missing something on this whole exercise. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Now, why didn't, why doesn't your answer surprise me? I wonder. <laughs> Kinneret, before we call on you, and I know you have others, Jack and Sasha and Elena, Carolyn, uh, I want to read something. I want to throw something else into this, okay? Because it's kind of all part of the same. It's a little different angle. So I want us to sort of widen the scope. It's Colin. It's a very famous koan about a very famous, about ninth century Zen, Zen master in China. And I'm only going to read part of it because it goes on and on. But the first part is the most important thing. And the koan is called, and koans, for those of you who don't know, are they're like Zen stories, but they're weird. They make little sense. And that's the whole point, that they don't make sense. And I could say more, but I won't. This one is called Toksan Carried His Bowls. Toksan one day came down to the dining room carrying his bowls. Seppo, who was the cook, said, Old master, the bell has not rung and the drum has not yet been struck. Why are you going with your bowls? Toksan at once turned back to his room. And then it goes on about how the cook thinks that he really got the better of this great, famous Zen master. And he tells others, and, and, and it goes on. But the main thing is, so Toksan, for some of you who don't, you know, those of you who've been immersed in Zen may know about him. He's a very famous teacher, very famous Zen master. And he's the one who started as about as being a scholar. And he was walking with his books or his scrolls everywhere and, you know, showing his great, great book knowledge. And one day he came across an old woman. And she and she asked him a question that he couldn't answer. So he said, gee, what who knows the answer? And he says, well, if you go over there, there's this guy, he's a hermit there and He'll give you the answer. So he does, and he meets him. And this is a guy who's almost illiterate, so completely the opposite of Toksan. And he sits with him, and they talk all through the night, and finally says, okay, I we need to go to sleep. And they have a candle. And as he's leaving and going out with a candle, the teacher blows it out. So that complete darkness. And the call of the story is that at that moment, Toksan awakened. And what he did, he did something pretty radical. The next morning, he burned all his books. Zen tends to be radical. That's what some people do. <laughs> so he burned all his books. And he went into Zen practice totally, became a famous master, became ran a very big monastery. He was very known that to get people out of their heads all the time and out of their heads, he would beat them. He would say, you know, or he would say, well, I would give you 30. If you say yes, I give you 30 blows. If you say no, I'll give you 30 blows. You know, and then you're saying, well, the, well, then what? And that was his way of getting them 
out of their usual way of thinking. So this is a powerful guy, okay? He's a powerful man. And now he's an old man. And, you know, monasteries have their ways. And so when the bell rings, it, there's no watches. Nobody had a watch then. So how did they know when to come together for lunch? The bell would ring or the drum would beat. Oh, he comes out carrying his bowls because that's they used to just carry their bowls, you know. And the cook, Seppo, who himself is quite famous, said, well, what are you doing here? You know, it's like bell hasn't rung, drum hasn't beaten. What are you doing here? And the guy says, oh, and he turns right back and goes back. My husband, Bernie Glassman, loved this koan. From the time that he turned 50, he used to evoke this koan all the time. And he'd talk about, look at what Tok Sandeli comes out. He's such a famous guy. Does he yell at anybody? No. Does he say, you can't talk to me like that. You don't know who I am. You know? No. He says, oh, okay. And it always meant a lot. He loved that. And I, then when he got sick, I saw for myself he did the same thing, and it moved me so much. I remember we had a lot of caregivers, which we needed for him. And one time on the weekend, I had to go somewhere on a Saturday, and I told him, you know, Bernie, I, I can't be here. And I looked for people, someone to show up, and the only person I found was this one guy who he didn't care for very much. He was almost, you know... He had people he liked, and like all of us, he had people he liked less. So I said to him, look, Bernie, I know you don't like this guy, but he's the only one I could find for Saturday. You know, weekends are tough. Can you, is it okay? You know, I'm sorry, but is it okay? And he looks at me, and then he says, okay. Just like that. Okay. And I was so moved. And right away, I thought of this koan. What are you doing out with your dining bowls, you know, you old guy? He says, oh, bell hasn't rung. Okay. And he turns back. And I feel like millennia, more than a millennium later, somebody else is talking the same way. Okay. And in the same sense, I must read to you something very brief. Oh. And this reminded me of Bernie's heart teacher was a man called Kori Hiroshi, who was one of the great Zen masters of the 20th century in Japan. Also a pretty strong guy, tough guy. And Bernie, when he was very much started his studies, he loved Kori Hiroshi. So he followed him to Japan for just about three weeks and and to his amazement, he always used to say this, I'm amazed. I saw these young kids, whippersnappers, people who knew nothing, go to him, to this amazing guy, and say, and tell him, you know, how he could say it like this, how he could say it like that. How did he, did he ever think of this? What about that? And Kori Hiroshi would say, ah, a saw deska. Oh, is that so? Oh, is that so? Huh. A saw deska. Is that so? And Bernie left Japan like, how does a man of that stature talk like these to these young kids who think that their ideas and what to do and what to change are so important? And it stayed with his, him his entire life. He always talked about Kori Hiroshi with his, ah, a sodeska. And, in, and I'll give you one last echo of this, which I found so fascinating. I found something that Norman Fisher out in California wrote. He talked about, he says, no, he says, he says, Oh, you know, every once in a while I go back to the San Francisco Zen Center to get some lettuce and tofu for, for food. 
And he wrote, sometimes new students look at, and I go to the refrigerator and I open it up, and he says, sometimes new students look at me, this old guy rooting around among the veggies, and especially if I'm a little unshaven, they wonder if I'm some homeless person stealing food. Some of them give me a dirty look. They think, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. And then he adds, Norman, I suppose I could think, what the hell? I used to be the boss around here. How could they not know who I am? But to tell you the truth, I think it is really wonderful that they don't know who I am. They can be free, and so can I. Yeah. So let me again ask you, you know, again, we have, I prepared these prompts, but I'm not sure they're necessary. And Kineret still has her hand up and I want to give her a chance to share. But for the rest of you, really think about how these stories, do these stories affect you in some way? And how do they affect you? You know, I matter to myself, but how do the changes of age, you know, being not so strong, not having so much energy, wrinkles, gray hair, whatever, how do they change how I walk in the world and how I'm seen in the world? Do I, how do I, how I relate to others? Do I feel bad about myself? Is there any humor and decrepitude? And is there a standard that other people expect of me as an older person? Fight, 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 you know, or like Dylan Thomas said, or don't fight, or disappear into the wall. You don't matter. How does that affect me? Okay, I'll stop talking. Kinere, and if, if you'd like to please respond, Oh, I see. Jeff already put these prompts in the chat. If you'd like to respond to the stories I told or to the prompts, raise your electronic hand. Okay, Kinera, thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you. I'm not sure how to lower my hand, but um, consider it lowered now. Um, I, I wanted to say I, I joined a little late, and so I kind of came in as I was hearing the prompt. And um, what I immediately felt, and in our small group, we had such a sweet conversation, and it was beautiful. Um, I immediately felt what what you were saying and what I think Kathleen was saying of this just like wave of deep relief. I, I heard it, and I was like, did I hear what she just said wrong? Like, was it supposed to be the opposite? Or I thought I thought it was a trick for a second. And I just felt this deep sense of relief. And I think the piece I want to say is that as someone, I was sharing this in my group, like as someone who is 42 and sort of in this, whatever this season is of the midlife time. And I feel a deep commitment to eldering as a young person and kind of seeing like walking that path so that by the time I age however old I get to be there's a sense of like years of having done work and not just showing up and then saying what now and I think that as I look and walk um, with different elders in my life and in culture it's really meaningful to I, I, I sometimes feel an obsession within myself and at my age and with peers, how am I special? How am I meaningful? How am I contributing? What is my thing? Like, there's a lot of like my and me and uniqueness and, and it's beautiful. Like it's so beautiful and it definitely leads to flowering and of creativity sometimes. And, but I notice that when these words come in and sometimes they do, I, I, I had this moment with our sweet dog this morning where he was came onto our little bean bag that he likes. And I was just, he was making different sounds and I was just mimicking him and mocking him. Every sound he made, I just mimicked back and he was getting annoyed and I was teasing him and we were playing together. And I was thinking like, 
what lets me be there is not being important. And like, I can, there's just a sense of when I, when I don't matter and when my work isn't meaningful or important, I feel like I'm more available at this moment to just look at the trees and go be with my dog and, and just be in, in whatever is showing up. So anyway, I, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kinneret. Okay, the floor is open. We have about 10, 15 minutes. So please, there's been a lot of content here. What comes up for you? Please, Sandy. Thank you. Something that has arisen for me is uh, reflection on how, I guess maybe a clinging to the importance of my life can really influence dying. And I'm thinking about being present when other people have been dying or after they have died and what has happened maybe to the family and the friends. So I, I just think about what I mentioned in our group is that I, <clears throat> my reflection included how, you know, it's almost like this turn taking as a human being coming into existence in life. I have a turn to, embrace jobs and to do them to the best of my ability, but to realize that it's just a turn taking, that it's not an ownership of creation of self and, or inflated self. And, and I guess that's connected as well to the meaning of my life that while there is importance in that role and being a part of, so the interdependence, the interconnectivity that you know, when my turn is finished, I use the description of like an amoeba, how it reshapes. And, and so that's just what I was reflecting on. But it was, it was suddenly being aware of how some people I have known have controlled family members with the importance of their life. And the struggles that everyone has had afterwards because of that. That's just, you know, a mind meandering for me now. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. That's very interesting. Uh, I'd like to call on Elena next because, Elena, you had your hand raised before and then you kind of lowered it. So would you like, would you like to please uh, unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. It's interesting because, the you know, so we, you know, we had the first set of prompts and now you gave us the second set. And even though, you know, I'm looking, the first one was my life is not important. This one is, do I matter to myself? And they're kind of similar, but my reaction is completely different. So it's really, yeah, it's really interesting that the, the first set of, of, of those prompts what I noticed in our small group was how easily we gravitated towards uh, concentrating on the other, on the second part of my work, does not matter. So we immediately jumped at looking in, at the work and the aspect of value coming through the jobs we do, the work we do. Uh, and, and there was something... I think something that says a lot about the culture we live in and how, you know, the jobs are so important in how we position ourselves in life. But my reaction to the, my life not being important, it's, it's just gives me so much space and lightness and makes it easier to just have, have this, it's like the weight is being taken off my shoulders of I don't have to worry about it. And that the you know that the, the the other set of prompts is interesting. I you know I I think the the older I am, the 
the less seriously I'm taking myself. Thanks for that. And that's that makes it easier to move through the world with greater ease because I'm not so I'm I'm not so attached. But I struggle with with the aches and pains, and you know I I hope I can kind of treat them more lightly. <laughs> but it's a struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Lynn, please, hi to you. Hi, everybody. I had a really strong <laughs> defiance reaction to, to those, the, the two statements. But, you know, because, because I'm, I, I've, I've, just, I've just come off of four weeks of acute sciatica. And so I was, that stopped my somewhat, my, my sort of constant activity. I, I had to pull back from that and slow down. And that was, so that gave me, you know, it gave me time to just spend a little more time just being and not so much time doing. But my, my strong reaction was that those statements are BS. I was not quite as respectful and polite as, as the other responses have been. But I, so, so I really kind of I've get, I also get the relief that people have gotten from those statements because even though I'm, even though I'm, I'm still very active in my community, I, I, when when I'm not able to be as active as I would, as I habitually am, it it is comforting to know that that yet you know, I can't even say it <laughs> that I don't matter. My work doesn't matter, but it's there's really there is a level of comfort. There is a level of comfort in that. One of the things that that popped out for me in the in the new prompts was, you know, the expectations of others about how old people should act. And I don't think there's really a standard. I think there's more of a preconceived notion that I am. And it, it's a relief to me when when I do go out in the world, I don't feel like I have to dress up and present in a certain way like I used to. It's more, I'm more comfortable with myself. And, you know, if I show up in a, a baggy t-shirt and jeans, that's because I just need to be comfortable that day. And I don't worry about how, how that's going to affect other people. I mean, I try to be respectful going into certain, certain spaces, you know, and dress accordingly, but I don't, I don't worry about that. And I'm not concerned about that the way I was when I was younger. And that that's a tremendous relief to me. And this is a great group. And thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, we still have time. Good. Suzanne, please. Hi there. Suzanne disappeared. Mary. Well, I think I may be saying what other people are saying in in ways someone in our small group mentioned work you know is this work that is recognized by the system which had never occurred to me i you know i think it's important to recognize work as you know something beyond anything that gets paid or you know, work in the biggest sense. And what system am I, do I think I'm operating within? What system do I recognize or honor or, you know, place myself within is very important to me as I age because I'm not going to be judged by such and such system. I don't care what that system is proposing or recommending or acknowledging. So what is the system that I'm in allegiance with is very important to me. And I, in Tokusan, I see that he, I, I heard it again because someone had just said the system, I heard Tokusan left because he had finished 
the point is that when you finish, you go out and you wash your bowl. So that's what he did. He was no longer in the system that we have to wait for the bells to tell us that when we finish, then we go wash. He was no longer in that system because he had aged out of it or it was no longer relevant to him. He knew what to do. And that was a grace of age. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Shinru. And Pat Dolan, hi there. Please unmute. Hi there. I what's been striking me about this is how each of us has has because each of us comes from a different place, each of us has a different task. So I'm the firstborn child. I'm junior. I was good at school. I was good at sports. At in my profession, when I walked into the classroom, I was a center of attention. And, you know, it would be easy for me, and I'm sure it happened, to think that I was more important than I actually was. And in order to be a good teacher, I taught writing. You have to convince people in the room that they're the important ones, and you are not. And so, you know, in a certain sense, I, I look at myself and I say, there is every reason for me to believe that I am important, more important than I quote unquote really am. And there's every reason for me to believe that my job in any given room is to make myself seem unimportant and other people seem important. And for colleagues of mine who were younger or browner or women, their job was to make sure that they got hurt. And so, you know, my sort of comfort with the kind of statement, I'm not important, comes from probably this is something that I've felt like I, I've had to remind myself. Um, and I'll tell you what, the nuns, if you're in Catholic elementary school, will remind you of if, <laughs> if you're not reminding yourself. But it, it is a very different set of tasks. And... You know, I expect that if I become more obviously infirm, I will start having the task of making myself heard a little bit more than I have in the past. Hmm. And that will be an interesting change. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. And Mary Remington, it's nice to see you again. And I'm going to ask if, you know, for you to be the last one to share now. I'll be straight to the point and hi, E. Thank you for this. <laughs> As I get older, I find that my sense of my anything is softening my life, my work, and that the context of my life is more in the view of us and we. And I don't know the first thing about if what I do matters or not, but I do feel that this energy of living by vow and living by resonance and living by love tends to be my deepest kind of Northern star. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful way to end. I, I'm just going to say the last, in that story that Norman Fisher wrote about himself, and I'll just, I'll just read to the end of that paragraph, which I didn't before. So he wrote, I suppose I could think, what the hell, I used to be the boss around here. How could they not know who I am? But to tell you the truth, I think it is really wonderful that they don't know who I am that they can be free, and so can I. When I think I know who I am, then I'm in trouble. And anyway, the new student has something to teach me for sure. He's my teacher. He's the Dharma master, and I really am just some old homeless guy rooting around for food. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> not change roles, isn't it? <laughs> very freeing. 
So two weeks from today on December 4, we're going to do Am I Still Loved? And what I wrote under that was, I was so coddled when I was born. Now, I'm not coddled, unless I'm senile. Not even cuddled. Whether I live with someone or not, with a partner or in a community or alone or not, tell me, what happens to love at this age? What happens to love at this age? Much later, I think second to last topic will actually be a little bit encourage us to talk about being a man, being a woman, about a different form of love, sex, sexuality, whatever. But for now, in two weeks, what happens to love at this age? Okay, thank you very much, everybody.